seen transaction memory say, okay, let's copy this little wedge out of database while we work on it, and then if it didn't crash, we'll copy it back again. Basically, what transaction memory is. And it takes, it sort of encourages you, this shared memory thing, which is completely breaking down and should have died a complete death about five years ago. It's given it another lease of, lease of life for two or three years, but I mean, it's completely mad. So it shouldn't be used. It also introduces single bottlenecks and single points of failure into systems. Very bad idea. Right. Another reason why you want uh, message passing and you want these kind of architectures is um, the idea that if you want to build something that's fault tolerant, you need at least two computers. You can't build something fault tolerant with one computer. Because if the whole computer crashes, that's it. So you need at least two. You want to make it very fault tolerant, you might have a hundred of them, a thousand of them, a million. Um, and if, if you take the case when you've got two computers, you'd have to copy all the data that you need to carry on. If you're one computer and I'm the other one, uh, and you crash, if we'd left all the vital data that's needed on you and you've crashed, I can't carry on. So we need to copy everything. This is the original reason why we made Airlang. This was right back in 19... Um, seven, no, 84 or something like that. I remember with Robert Veerding, we were going to a conference in, in Bournemouth and uh, there were the software the telecoms industry and people were saying... Um, they were, they were coming up with all sorts of thingamajigs, you know, methods for building distributed fault tolerant systems. Or, no, they methods for building distributed systems. And I kept poking my hand up, I sat in the audience, and I stuck up my hand and said, what happens if it crashes? And the processor crashes. They said, well, no, no, so, well, it doesn't work then. I said, well, that's not much use, is it? <laughs> so, so we saw all this stuff being presented in front of our eyes. It didn't work. I don't know why they bothered to present it. <laughs> So, so I remember thinking very strongly, well, the only way to um, make reliable systems is actually by copying everything. Actually, not just me. This was an Ericsson tradition. Um, Ericsson built in Sweden in 1974, built the AXE, uh, telephone exchange, which has gone all around the world. And it was a fault-tolerant thing, and it had two processors. Um, and they copied each other all the time. If one of them crashed, the other one took over. So that was a sort of architectural thing that Ericsson had put into its products from about 1974. Oh. Thank you. So this notion of um, copying, that, that was sort of hanging around. Perhaps I should show you. I, I'll just swap slides and I'll come back to this because I, I gave another lecture. And it's, it's kind of fun to see the... So, yeah, I'm going to show you a few of these, not, not a lot. Let's go. Yeah, this is, this is kind of when it started. Um, Isaiah Lang program at number one. So it didn't, wasn't called Air Lang at the time, it was called something else. No, it didn't have a name. Erlang was anything I was working on at the time. Um, so, here we are in 1986, okay? And uh, if you think, right, I, I can tell you, if you think inventing a programming language is just about sort of sitting there and writing a compiler, you forget it, because it's much more fun than that. You have all sorts of things. You have political infighting. Um, <laughs> you have wars with other people. You, you, they, they cancel your project. Um, uh, what else happens? Oh, yeah. I mean, you, have to, you have to market it. What it's called changes with time. Uh, and, and you have to get sort of... You have to learn survival techniques, you know, um, how to survive. I mean, for example, in 19... When was it? Yes, 1998, Airline was banned uh, from Ericsson. And uh, we got very upset about this. And, uh, and, uh, quit, actually. Um, the company. And, uh, and we're very upset about. We were very upset about this. Actually, you know, people couldn't sleep at night. Ulcers, you know, this sort of stuff. Well, yeah, yeah, couldn't sleep at night anyway. And uh, we got all hot-headed because we were young and impetuous. 
you know, I was like 50 at the time. <laughs> so we quit and uh, started the company, which we sold for 1.4 billion kroner about 18 months later. It's okay. <laughs> um, now, you know, I was working on another project and uh, they also cancelled it. But I was more experienced, so we renamed it. You know, and my boss came in and said, uh, well, do you want the good news or the bad news? Well, we'll start with the bad news. Oh, we cancelled your project. What's the good news? Well, we're starting a new project, he said. Uh, what's that? Oh, it's a test system. Hmm. We'll just change its name. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you do, lads, you know. When they cancel your project, just change the name and carry on as if nothing could happen. <laughs> Very good technique. I talked to Bjarne Sørstrup and he said, uh, he thought that was very funny because he said that C++ got cancelled 11 times before it sort of made the life of day. <laughs> so there we were making a, a language. It started off actually as a prologue interpreter. So I wrote, um, actually there's a bit which isn't on that side which I should put on it. It started off actually as a small talk, emulation of communicating objects. And uh, I, ordered, I, oh, I ordered the first <coughs> small talk machine in Sweden from Tektronix. And it had a very long delivery time. It had like a six week delivery time. And when I was waiting for it to be delivered, uh, a guy called Roger Skargavell said, I had a notation for um, describing what I was doing to people. He said, Well, that's a prologue program. <coughs> and I said, What do you mean? He took me into his office, sat me down, and showed me Prologue. Have you done Prologue? Who knows Prologue? Okay, you've all got to learn. You've changed the course schedule, okay? Stop whatever they're doing. <laughs> Teach them Prologue. Right? Because Prologue is a, you know, it blows your mind. It does. I'm not kidding. I went around for two weeks ago. Somebody must know Prologue. Please help me here. Right. Yes. And you go around going, where's the program? I haven't the program, but it works. It's magic. <laughs> yeah, it's logic. It's predicate logic. That's brilliant. Um, and so I emulated this stuff in Prologue. And then, of course, the tectonics machine came, and I didn't even unpack it. It sat on my, uh, my desk, but I was packing it in Prologue. My boss said, why don't you go open that thing? No, no, no. Then the salesman started phoning up and said, what do you think of the tectronics machine? Oh, it's great. It's wonderful. What's coming? Have you opened it? <laughs> Salesman found up. Oh, we've got another customer who wants to buy it. Could, could we bring them for a demo? Oh dear. Um, no, I'm very busy. <laughs> <laughs> I, bet you I was able to. And there was a bloke down the corridor at the small talk. He kept on coming in and saying, Could you use that? So I gave it to him. That's, it. that's how I didn't become a small talk programmer. Um, anyway, this prologue stuff tiddled along and it ended up being a little language. Oh, well, yeah, this was the algebra. This, this is prologue. Um, the little algebra that actually became Erlang. Uh, problem with that is it was sequential. You wanted to do lots of these in parallel. And so Erlang actually started as adding concurrency to prologue. So I took prologue, which is a sequential language, and made it concurrent, doing a meta interpreter. Prologue is very easy to write meta interpreters. So and this was the first prologue interpreter. Uh, I tried, I was invited to the History of Programming Language conference. And they said, well, find all the historical documents you can find. And most of them were thrown away, of course. Um, so this was the earliest thing I could actually find. And it refers to, it is actually version 1.06 of Erlang. Um, and there's a comment at the start that just says, version 1.03 is lost in the mists of time. But that was written in uh, 1986, so I don't know when that was referred to. No idea. And uh, let me see. This was the entire documentation, which we gave the users. It's now spread into three or four books and 10,000 you know, 10, pages. So what, there wasn't, wasn't much you could do at the time. You could send a message and spawn the process. Uh, this, this was the first course. Uh, 
activist in a prologue course. I've turned into there. Yeah, this is airline in prologue. This was before PowerPoint had been invented, so courses were much more fun in those days. <laughs> <laughs> this is a this is a list with a head and a tail. <laughs> and, and this was the first interpreter. And in fact, I think it says, yeah, at that time, the language took four days to completely rewrite, completely re-implement from scratch. It took four days to completely rewrite and ran at an amazing 245 reductions per second. Now it runs, a, I don't know, 12 million or something. Or lots. We don't even measure it anymore, it's so fast. <laughs> And when you did it, I remember, it took, well, we, we wrote it in prologue, and then we wrote the virtual, I wrote the virtual, 